Hello, everybody. Welcome once again to another installment of a Rebel. Could you, could you do one more one more riff that goes up instead of down? Because that depressed me. Okay, let's do that. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> we're okay. That was descending. No, nope, we're yeah. going to go ascending. Yeah, let's try that. Yeah, that's better. Do you feel better? Much better now. Okay, because I had to descend at the end just to get to a... a, a well, Jews, a, Jews do that. A resolution. Descend, no. descend at the end. Uh, yes, I'm, I'm, I'm on my descent right now. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, I want to welcome the great Jeff Canoe to my humble little podcast, A Rebel Without Applause, coming to you from my little television studio apartment right here in the wood of the holly under the sign and just what a pleasure to have jeff and for those of you that don't know jeff has crossed a million boundaries in show business beginning as a trailer editor to an editor to directing some of the funniest and most iconic comedies of the 1980s and beyond he's with me here today jeff Cadu, welcome how are you uh, I'm, I'm, uh, now that I heard all that, I'm very depressed. It's because I, I just, I just, I just wrote a memo, uh, not a memo, a memoir <laughs> that, my, that my, my kids made me write uh -huh. about my life because they think it's interesting or whatever. And one of my sons said, this has to be the title because you said this once and I want, you have to have that as the title of the memoir. And it's, I'll burn that bridge when I come to it. That's a brilliant title. <laughs> so that's the title. So, anyway. So, so you're living proof that success doesn't bring happiness. It, it does while it's happening. But at, at some point when you lose it, it, it's very depressing. But let's not let's not be down or let's be down. Let's be down. Let's go where it goes. I okay, mean, well, um, as yeah. I said to you, my core joke as a comedian is I'm living proof that if you're white and you're privileged and you hang in there and you pay your dues and you stay disciplined and you never ever let go of your dreams, you still might not make it. So that's, that has some thematic, uh, what, you, you know, resonance for me. What can I say? You know, but, and I have a much shorter one, not, not the same, but I tell this to my sons, which is don't trust your friends. <laughs> <laughs> that's a very good, especially if yeah. they're, in show business yes exactly yeah and it's yeah, easier right, if your good. friends are talented anybody still listening to this i don't think so they, they probably shut it off by now well, this nobody's listening this isn't live this will be captured and then all right whatever uploaded so it's it's it, right now you have, you have my permission to cut you know take things out of context do whatever you want okay well all you right. know basically i just leave this as is because, you know, and then I, I edit more the audio only because dead air, you know, like when you see people struggling for a thought, it's interesting if you can see it, but if not, and you're just listening, it's got to go. So basically that's- Yes, my absolutely, process. absolutely. My son had a podcast years ago and, and it was called the 10 minute podcast. And he checked, no matter how long the conversation went, he, crammed it into 10 minutes and it was very easy to listen to because it really, it, you know, it was tight. Yeah. I, that's a challenge, you know, and it takes a lot of time. Like the, the video is way easier than the audio because the audio, I really got to get in there with my little, like my dental tools and clean and every little pop and just to defend my sensibilities, every pause, but that's the process. What I'm really curious about, I mean, so many things, because you started out in trailer editing, which is, and you, from, you know, I was looking at some of these credits. These are the most iconic movies of their decade. Midnight Cowboy, The Graduate, uh, Rocky, and Annie Hall. What kind of collaboration did you have with the actual directors, or was it between you and the studios? How, it how was that mostly, work? mostly with the studios. It, it, in, with certain filmmakers, they they wanted to be involved, which was smart. Mm -hmm. uh, mostly, it was the studio marketing people and 
then there was a whole daisy chain of other people that could put their two cents in. So it was not a very clean process working for the studios. Um, and every once in a while, something would go through, you know, untouched, which is a very, I, out of 400 trailers, I would say maybe 10 things went through untouched that I did. But one was The Graduate and one was Midnight Cowboy and one was Rocky and one was Cuckoo's Nest. And they were a big thing, Annie Hall. I worked with Woody on every film during this certain period of time from Bananas to Annie Hall. And he was interested or concerned about if if some studio hack would misrepresent his movie, uh, which, which I understood. So we had a process where I would shoot an interview with him at his movieola or wherever, and I would ask him questions and he would come up with sort of on, off the cuff funny answers or whatever. And then I would edit all that together, cutting away to scenes from the movie. And it, it was fun. That was like the style of thing that I did with Woody, except for uh, Annie Hall. That I treated with like a, like a more serious film when, when that was just cast and scenes and there was no narration and no, no overlay of, of a advertising style to it. And no conversations with Ralph Rosenblum who actually edited the movie? And no credits himself with saving it. <laughs> the conversation that, that I've had with Ralph was once, uh, maybe we said hi on that movie. I did a movie called Eddie Macon's Run, where I was the writer, the director, and the editor. And then the, the producer, a guy named Marty Bregman, who wasn't nice, uh, basically saw the first cut of the movie. And before it was five minutes in, he turned to his henchman and said, we, we need a new editor. And I said, wait a minute. I said, first of all, you haven't seen the movie. Secondly, editing is the one thing that I have a lot of experience with. This is only my second directing thing. I don't think you need a new editor. They called Ralph Rosenblum and he, they, they paid him to come in and recut my movie. But he really wasn't that into it. So he did it in like two days and took the money and, and I didn't use his cut. And then we had, uh, uh, tell me if I'm going on, because I- No, this I, is interesting. I ramble. Okay. Yeah. So then, then the producer, this Marty Bregman, right. who had the same agent as I had, he was going to fire me off the picture. And then the agent said to me, let Bregman have a screening of his version, and you have a screening of your version. And then whichever one tests the best, it was a universal thing, let Universal pick the one that tests the best. So I thought, all right, that's fair. So we went out to Las, Las Vegas. That was Bregman's choice. It was, it was Eddie Macon's run. It was, it was a B movie. And we had two screenings. Mine was the seven o'clock and his was the nine. I think that was how it went. Right. And my version was about five minutes longer than his version because there was a subplot in the movie that was really the heart of the movie. Because it was about a man who escapes from prison and right. runs across Texas to get to Mexico to be with his wife and kid. So Bregman, who was a kind of a heartless person, felt that all the scenes relating to the wife and kid and all that stuff had to go. So then all that was left was a guy running across Texas to be in Mexico and dealing with some bad people or whatever. So the audience for the his version thought his version was much longer than mine because they weren't emotionally involved in the movie. Anyway, the cards were much better for my version than his. So... We, in the lobby after the Universal people present their analysis of the cards and whatever, Bergman walks up to me and I think he's going to say, okay, you win. But what he says is, I'm going to cut your fucking balls off. And he did. And I got kicked off the movie at that point and they finished his version. And Ralph Rosenblum got the editing credit? No, I got the editing, I got the editing credit. Ralph didn't want, even want the credit for his two days of work. But then I flew out to L.A. to talk to the head of the studio because I, I was incensed. And I said, look, it's your five million dollars. One version tests better than the other. Why would you finish the one that tested worse? He said, look, Marty Bregman's a powerful guy. He represents Al Pacino. He manages Al Pacino. He manages Alan Alda. I'm not going to fight your battles for you. So that was it. I was gone. How did you like? Working with yourself as an editor when you were directing. Oh, I was, I was, I worked well with me. I, I tended <laughs> to, no, because the thing is, I didn't like, like when 
I didn't have much experience with other editor directors I, or or editors really because the 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 film editor on the movie never got involved in the trailer. It was always the producer or the director and the studio people. Right. So the editor, editors used to resent some guy coming in and chopping up their movie. Right, but I mean, when you actually edited the feature, not the trailer, as a director editor of a feature. You know, right. But, but what I'm saying is that I, I learned somehow that. It's a lot of trial and error, but a lot of the film editors that I had met on on other movies, mm -hmm. they had like an ego about it. So they would ha be there with their their apprentice or their assistant, and they'd have a grease pencil, and it, it was on the movieola, and it was on film at the time, right. and they would like tap the film. That's where to cut. Now, when I was doing it, I thought, well, I got to I'll cut here. Oh no, no, maybe I'll cut here. Oh no, it looks a little better here. It was all trial and error. So. There were a lot of splices in a row because it was tape splicing. Right. Uh, and the splices made noise when they went through the moviola. So the editors <laughs> didn't like it. It seemed sloppy. So they'd like to make one cut and leave it alone. Oh. So we didn't get along because I felt that was lazy. It was, I mean, I could never have just made one cut and thought, yeah, that's good. I had to see if it was a little better this way or a little better that way. So that was how I learned to work, which is don't think you know until you try. My experience with the moviola was that every time I made a tape, if I didn't feed it properly, it was like a machine gun and the sprockets were just blasting all over the place. And then I had an hour of repairing sprockets just so I could look at the movie. And it was like I, I, I couldn't. It took a while to learn to control the tension. I have to admit, I never really did it, but it almost drove me insane. Yeah. And and when that used to happen, I used to say, I guess God doesn't like that take. So let's go. <laughs> this is another take. <laughs> yeah. And then you so when you'd have a cut of a movie, ultimately, it would be all these tape splices kind of yes. jiggering through this jalopy of, a, of an editing machine. Right. Well, so that that was true. Actually, all the way until. Nerds was cut with film and tape. Gotcha was cut with film and tape. Tough Guys was cut with film and tape. Uh, then the next one was Troop Beverly Hills. I think that that was also. Yeah, they were all film and tape. There was no at, video editing. At some point, though, you went from the upright to the flatbeds, right? Uh, yes. Kicking and screaming, but yes. But I that seemed that, like there was less tension on the actual film. So Absolutely was. It was quieter. It was, it was much better. Yeah, less tears and disasters now eddie macon's run was the beginning of one of the most important relationships in your life i believe and that's with kirk douglas that's true uh, kirk and honestly the one good thing bregman did was force me to use kirk douglas because he wanted a name for some foreign sales purposes whatever i wanted to hire either peter boyle or gene hackman who weren't that big a deal yet right uh, somebody that was very, it was, it was, a, it was the whole idea was it was a New York or New Jersey cop who has to work in Texas and hates Texas and hates cowboys. So I wanted a real New Yorky guy, Peter Boyle. Yeah. But Bregman just insisted that I go see he, he, the, the two decisions he forced on me. One, one was to use John Schneider for the lead. Uh, cause I didn't think he was very good. He was a nice guy. And in the end, he was pretty good in the movie. But I, from Bo Duke on Dukes of Hazard, that's not who I saw in this movie. Right. Plus, he was like 20. And, and my character, as written, was like in his 30s with two kids. So mm -hmm. I had to change the script and make him younger and take, take kill off one of his kids and whatever. But Bregman, that was Bregman's choice. He said to me one day, and, and here I had optioned the book, adapted the script. And now he was the boss. And somehow he could tell me what to do. So. One day he says, uh, what do you think about John Schneider for the lead? And I said, nah, I don't really think so. Well, you're on a plane tomorrow. You're going down to Atlanta. If he approves you, he's, he's, he'll do the movie. So I was, he was going to approve. He approves you. Yeah. So that was that. Then it was like, uh, you got to have a meeting with Kirk Douglas. You got to go out to LA. I go, I don't know, Kirk. I love Kirk Douglas, but I don't think that's the guy. He goes, yeah, you're going. To, his name has foreign sales value. You're going. So, okay, I was in awe of Kirk Douglas and Berg, whatever. So I flew out and I had a meeting with Kirk and he said, I won't do a Kirk Douglas impression. I saw your first movie. He said, I, he said, I saw your first movie. I, I thought it was really good. But I thought that the main character was was played to, to one note. Hal Holbrook was to one note. 
okay. which was my fault because that's how I thought it should be because the guy's not, not thinking of killing himself and his family. He's not going to be like a, a roller coaster. He's going to be in a very strange, alienated place. Anyway, Kirk says, I like the movie and I would have done it differently. Okay, but I'll do this movie. So he agrees to do it. And he comes down to uh, at Laredo where we were shooting. Again, I'm, I'm tell me if I'm going on too long. No, this is interesting. This is okay. I, yeah. So I had started shooting because his part was a little smaller. I started shooting a week or two before he showed up. And I got a long memo from him, script changes or, or suggestions. And I didn't have any experience with this whole process. So I thought, yeah, I don't, actors don't make script changes. What do I know? So he comes down and the first thing he says to me when I go to say hello to him at his hotel is, did you get my script notes? I said, yeah, I got them. He goes, what do you think? I said, well, I mean, do you want to talk about them? Because we both had a copy. I said, yeah. I said, all right, let's talk. I start going down the list and I go to the first one. Yeah, I see what you're saying here, but I don't I don't want to do that. The second one, no, I mean, I think this and I'm I'm justifying because I'm I think I'm the director and the writer. I better be able to justify what's in the script. Right. About the sixth or seventh one, uh it was about there's this there's a relationship where Eddie Macon has a get is running away from jail and he gets helped by this rich playgirl woman, and in the end. She helps him get back to his wife and kid, and she ends up by herself, and Kirk ends up letting him go at the last minute because he feels sorry for him. And so there, these two characters are isolated at the end. He says, I want to end up with that girl. And I go, no, 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 no. I said, really? I, I, I don't think that's a very good idea. He goes, you know what? You said no to every one of my suggestions, and I got a lot more suggestions. So why don't you get the fuck out of my hotel room? So oh my god threw me out of his hotel room not physically he could have though and now i'm thinking okay i'm gonna get fired off this movie uh when bregman hears about it i'm gone i don't know what to do next morning was kirk's first day of shooting and i get a knock on the door it's his driver mr douglas wants you to ride out to the location with him so i get into his motor home and we're riding out he goes listen i liked your movie and I think you're talented, but you got a lot to learn about how to direct actors and how to work on a, on a movie. And I'm just telling you, you shut down and act like you're not listening. And that's going to make the actor shut down. At the very least, you have to act as if that was an interesting idea. And let me think about it. You don't say no, 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 no. Not so a bad note, by the way. Great note. So I said, ah, oh, you're right. You're right. I go, but you know, Kirk, you you said one thing in the scene. There's a scene where you interrogate this kind of Texas bimbo woman. And, you know, you, you want to find out where John Schneider went the night before or it came through their property, something. And you wrote, I want it to be a seduction, not an interrogation. So I thought you meant you wanted to have, Make have sex with her. And right. get the information that way. He goes, no, that's stupid. He goes, I, I want to be, I want to get the information from her in a soft way, not bully her like a cop. I'm a tough cop. I don't have to bully a woman. I went, oh. And he, then he told me about a scene in The Champion where he had a scene with Marilyn Maxwell where he's going to threaten her. But rather than do it tough, he threatens her very softly. Like, I'm really worried about you because if you ever do that again, you're going to be in the hospital for a really long time. You know, he, he and I went, oh, I was going, oh, oh, oh. So he became my teacher on that movie, especially at, about production things. But he, every day at the end of the day, when you probably remember this, you're exhausted and you just want to go home. But you got, you have prep to do for the next day and all that. So Kirk says to me, where are we shooting tomorrow? And I went, uh, the jailhouse. All right, let's go over there right now, you and me, and we'll talk through the scene without the whole crew standing around. I went, really? He goes, yeah. I go, really? Okay. So every day we'd go th at the end of the day and he had the energy for it. And it was really helpful you know, to figure stuff out so that there's not a hundred people standing around while you're figuring stuff out. And it so, shows how much he cared about the process. Yeah, no, he was great. He was great. And, and he so was prepared. He, he had thought about the script. So 
I remember, you know, my experience was limited, is limited relative to yours, but I, Chris Maloney was kind of a pain, you know, but what I loved is that he really cared. And so it didn't matter, like you care. So that's the main thing. And most people don't care. So like what somebody cares, you know, of course he had been a great producer. I mean, Spartacus. Right. I mean, he, he worked with, you know, Kubrick. uh, uh, he worked with he worked with Kubrick and he worked with the way name went out of my head because that's an aging thing. Uh, this very famous screenwriter who wrote Spartacus, Dalton Trumbo. Dalton Trumbo. There you go. Yeah, Paths of Glory. Right I mean, now, Dalton Trumbo wasn't allowed to have a screen credit because of the blacklist. But he broke so, it. Did did Kurt? Yeah, it was it, it, the the contract said screenplay by Sam Jackson. <laughs> and Kirk said, "I can't do that. I mean, it's Dalton Trumbo. He wrote the script, and I'm I'm putting it on there. Fuck it. Right? What's going to happen? What are they going to do? Not release the movie? So right? He did it. And and it it stuck. And you know that was great. He was he was. I mean, he was. There were a lot of people in Hollywood that didn't like him because he was he was kind of tough when he had to be, but he was smart. And uh, in the end, he did great work. And and I was lucky enough to be his friend for like a long time." And we had, you know, we, we, we developed projects together that never got made. We, I did these two stage pieces with him, you know, about his life that he wanted to do. And I just was kind of the objective eye in the, in the audience watching him and helping him sort of tighten the thing. And we did scenes behind him on the screen. Uh, and that was three days of or three shows and was packed and everybody loved it. And then he just said, I don't have the energy. I can't do it anymore. They wanted to take it to New York. And he said, I just can't. He couldn't. And so I did that with him. And that was, that was not that long after he had his stroke, but he still wanted to do it. Speaking of his stroke, I had a very good friend years ago who lived in Montecito and he goes, come on, I'm going to Kurt's birthday party. I go, yeah. And so I went, Drove up to Montecito. He used to go to all these parties. He's kind of a ne'er do well. And there I am. It was after his stroke. And I remember I got to meet Cab Hunter, Eve Marie Saint. You oh, know, really? they were all there. And he was so nice. And the prevailing thought I got is people said, he's so much nicer after his stroke. Like it apparently was a huge dose of humility for him. To I'm sure it was. And yeah. And then he used to do things like, reach out to people with strokes and he wrote a, when Bob Downey Jr. was in jail Kirk wrote him a letter listen don't you know you got to get through it but you know learn from it and don't get disheartened and, and then I, he showed me the letter he got back from Downey saying thank you so much you know this means so much to me blah 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 he was a good yeah. guy yeah I loved Ace in the Hole and all, all, so many good movies has and, of glory you know you know, and he and he had a sense of humor. Like one time I was meeting him somewhere for lunch and I was like, this is 10 minutes late. And I get to the table and he goes, never keep a legend waiting. <laughs> now, what was it like? Because you did tough guys. And then there's this other legend out there. They did. They had a, a deep history together in movies, um, you yes. know, with Burt Lancaster. By the way, I was just. People say, did you watch this show? I go, I don't watch shows. I watch Turner Classic Movies. What are you kidding? And I watch MSNBC and I watch sports. That's it. I don't see the, I'm not binge watching the latest episode of My Guy Saul. I just can't. And, and recently was that great movie. Seven Days in May. Exactly. Um, yeah. I, yeah. I downloaded it and now I have it and I've watched it twice or it, it's really good. Really good. And there was, there was a point at which someone maybe spielberg or someone was thinking of remaking it a modern version uh-huh it never quite happened but when you look at what's going on in the world today you know with the, with the insurrection whatever it it's you know torn from today's headlines right of. now i'm trying to remember the movie um kurt's the marine corps guy and is he the one who's the coup leader and no, Bert's no. the one who thwarts it or is it the opposite? No, no, no. kirk developed the script through his company and they had done some work together and he thought Bert would be great to have in the movie. And he said to Bert, whichever part you want, you can have, and I'll play the other guy. And Bert chose to be the bad guy. The bad guy. Okay. Right. So Kirk was kind of his loyal, he, he, he was his loyal, whatever you call, you know, the, the guy who's sort of the, 
attache of a powerful man. He was right in the military. There must be a name for that. But so he was underneath Bert and looked up to him and admired him. And then he gets wind of this plot that Kirk was not uh, privy to. Yeah. And it's a plot basically to take over the country. And Kirk first hears about it. He doesn't believe it. And then uh, little by little, he smells that's going on because of the way he's been left out of things that are happening. And there's a date set and they call it, there's going to be a, an exercise, some kind of an exercise, but it's really the takeover of the country. And he goes to the president, which was Frederick March. And, and now they're trying to, because Frederick March is a low in the ratings president. So he's in trouble and Bert's going to take over the country unless they, they expose this plot. So that's what the, what the movie was. Who Was that Patty? Show? I don't even know who wrote that. It's Rod Serling. Rod's okay. Wow. My favorite movie as a kid, you know, was, was Burt Lancaster and Jim Thorpe, all American. That was like, as a kid, if someone said, what's your favorite movie of all time? I go, are you kidding? It's Jim Thorpe, all American, you know, the football. I just love that movie. I loved him my whole life. You know, yeah, what Burt, were those two like? What were they like? Uh, well, they were on screen when they were working. They were mostly exactly what you wanted. They were Kirk and Bert. Right. But in the process of before we shot the developing process, Kirk had a lot of notes. Bert had none. And what I found out about their history was that's how it always was. Kirk had a lot of thoughts and ideas. Bert just wanted to shoot the script and he was really found Kirk really annoying. So even though they so they were like an old married couple, you know, they loved each other, but they got on each other's nerves, particularly Kirk got on Bert's nerves because he was always trying stuff or the energy or whatever. And Bert just wanted to shoot the movie. He was a little stiffer. He didn't need to do that. Mm -hmm. So, and I was kind of having done a movie with Kirk, he considered me Kirk's boy. And so he didn't like me. And he didn't like you. Yeah. He thought, I, you know, cause he just assumed that anything that I say is either cause that's what Kirk wanted or because I'm just like, I, I'm wrong for him. Plus, prior to the actual start of the shooting, I got the script from Joe Wazan, who was a friend of mine, who was the guy who gave, got me Revenge of the Nerds. And now he sent me the tough guy script and said, can you get this to Kirk? Because I know you have a relationship with him. So I did. And Kirk said, great, I'll get it to Bert. And he did. And Bert said, yes. We're all set to go. And then we start hiring crew and doing we're setting up we set it up at disney and now bert's manager bert's agent calls from icm and says uh we have to postpone the movie bert just took another job so i gotta call kirk and say listen we gotta push back because kirk bert and kirk goes jesus fucking christ all right when two months okay and kirk wasn't getting a lot of work at this point bert was still doing things like atlantic city, atlantic city or whatever. Right. anyway kirk waited we waited uh and then oh, it was Bert was going over to Europe to make that that movie. And then about a month in, I get a call. Uh, the director of Bert's movie died. It, the movie's been canceled. He's coming back. So I thought, OK, here we go. So now we start to do really serious pre-production and we're hiring department heads and crews and going forward. Get a call one day from the same agent. Mr. Lancaster needs. Uh, uh, is just took another job doing a TV movie. Uh, I forget what it was. It was about the. Uh, I don't know if it was Ross Perot or somebody. It's somebody who tried to rescue the Iranian hostages by sending helicopters in. That this incident really happened. Anyway, oh, so yeah. Bert's going to play that guy. Hmm. And so once again, Kirk has to sit back and wait. So, okay, we take that. And then finally, Kirk, I can feel Kirk is getting really angry. I call the agent and I say, w where's Bert? He's in Mexico. Well, I want to go down and talk to him because this is getting ridiculous. He goes, well, you can't. Well, all right, give me his phone number. No, he doesn't want to talk to you. Okay. So finally they say, all right, Bert will be back on New Year's Day from Mexico. You can talk to him then. So, and I was living in New York at that moment for some reason. And I flew out New Year's Day. I'm sitting and waiting, waiting, keep calling. No, no, Burt Lancaster. And then finally, the agent's secretary called and says, 
uh, Ben wants to talk to you. So his name is Ben Benjamin. Ben gets on. Oh, no, I'm sorry. The, sec the secretary says, I uh, have a message. Mr. Lancaster passes. So I go, what? That He can't do that to Kirk. He can do it to me, but he can't do it to Kirk Douglas. Put him on the phone. Is he there? Yes. Put him on the phone. No. So the agent gets on the phone and I go, Ben. And he was also, that agent was ICM and I, that's where I was with too, but I didn't mean as much. I said, you just tell Burt Lancaster for me that I've always admired him. I think he's a great actor, but I also think he's an immoral, immoral irresponsible prick. So he goes, he says you're an immoral, irresponsible <laughs> prick. Okay, he heard you. <laughs> hang, hang. Now, uh, Kirk calls me. What happened? I go, Bert's out. We, we're going to send the script to Lee Marvin and Frank Sinatra. Kirk says, bullshit. Oh, and, and, and Frank Sinatra said, no, it's Bert's movie. And Lee Marvin, I don't know if he's responded or whatever, but Kirk, Kirk says, I'll call him. Kirk calls me back like an hour later. He says, I spoke to Bert. He's doing the movie. I go, really? He goes, yeah. Then I get a call from the agent. He goes, all right, Mr. Lancaster's doing the movie, uh, but you have to apologize for what you said. And this was back in the I'll burn that bridge when I come to it days. I said, no, what I said was absolutely correct about what he was doing to his friend Kirk Douglas at the time. And I'm not going to apologize. <laughs> a couple of calls back. OK, Bert's doing the movie, but he won't speak to you. <laughs> and, and that's how we started. I had to go through Joe was in. To, to talk to Burton Lancaster until he got tired of that game. And then we started to work normally together. But he so was you couldn't have just said, Kirk, would you just call Bert? Like they didn't have that kind of easy going, like, are you going to do this? Or you're, you're screwing me over, bro. It wasn't easy. They, you know, Kirk told me a story. He once got an award and Bert was being the presenter or introducing Kirk. And, and he said, ladies and gentlemen, Kirk Douglas would tell you that he's the most difficult man to work with. That he, Kirk Douglas would be the first to tell you he's a difficult man to work with. And I would be the second. <laughs> <laughs> so, but you could, but once you got on the set, I mean, you're working with these guys, they have, they have to feel like they're treated they were, equally or fairly by you. And they were. And, you know, I mean, I still was admired Burt Lancaster and he was perfect. He never did a bad take. He was perfect for that character, but he just was moody. And, and I guess he had physical discomfort and arthritis or something. And I don't know, we had other incidents. One time we, we, there was a scene where there was an actor named Simi Bo, uh, and he plays one of their old gang. They're trying to put their old gang back together to hijack the train. And they go into the room and the guy has a parrot that was it written in the script. I don't know exactly why there's a parrot. And so this guy, they walk in the room and the guy goes, get him up. And he pulls a gun on them. And the parrot right. goes, get him up, get him up. It, so the parrot's like echoing whatever this guy says. And finally, they realize they can't use this guy because he's nuts or whatever. Oh, he, the, he pulls the trigger and out comes a flag that says pow, something like that. So they walk out of the room, they give up on this guy. And, uh, the guy says something and Kirk turns around to him and says, screw you. And then he looks at the parrot. This wasn't in the script. And he goes, screw you too. And then he walks out. A week later, we're shooting something and Bert calls me into his trailer. Uh, you remember that scene in the hotel room? I said, yeah. You let Kirk add lib a lie. I said, yeah, the screw you yeah, to the parrot. I thought that was funny. If he does it again, I'm walking off the picture. <laughs> I mean, you could cut it out if you don't like it, you know. Yeah, yeah. but he, he, he didn't <laughs> like that Kirk was always adding shit. He didn't. Wow. Yeah, well, they were two. You know, they were both sort of prime athletes, too, in their prime. I mean, they were yeah. both very vigorous and impressive physical specimens. But I think by the time, I'm just asking, you did Tough Guys, that Bert was in more of a physical decline than maybe... Kirk Douglas was. Yes. And he died, you know, not long after that. Yeah, he had problems. And I don't know if you how much older than Kirk he was, but I think he was a little bit older. Yeah. I mean, those those are almost like they were both cut from the same mold. Although 
Kirk is, was a Jewish. He was the rag picker's son. He had a different sort of vibe, I think, probably than Burt Lancaster. I mean, yeah, was, Burt, Burt wasn't wasn't as free, as open as as a person. I don't think. Yeah. But look, you know, I I think he's great in the movie, and and I was honored to have directed the two of them. So that felt good to me. Uh, here's another scene. Uh, there's a scene in the movie where these guys have been in prison for 30 years and they come out and they're not supposed to associate with each other because they're not supposed to associate with right. convicts, whether ex-cons. So Kirk goes to get a drink at a bar, his old hangout called Mickey's. But now it's 30 years later and, it, and he goes in there and it turns out it's a gay bar, but he doesn't get it. Yet. <laughs> Right. So he goes in there and then the guy buys him a drink and then a guy asks him to, to dance. So then he's coming out and here comes Bert to come to the same place. And Kirk goes, don't go in there, Harry. Just don't go in there, right? <laughs> so we're, gonna, we're shooting the don't go in there part out in the street in front of the place. And we rehearse the, the take. And it's kind of like a two shot, but it's favoring Kirk because he's coming out of the place. And like a struggle breaks out during the rehearsal, like under the under the camera, you know. I mean, under the out of just out of frame. It's like, and he goes, and 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 he, and he goes, get your fucking hands off me, Bert. I know what you're trying to do. He was trying to turn an over the shoulder, turning Kirk, and make it a fifty fifty. Oh my god! Right, that's so hilarious. Yes. Yeah, How did like Dana it. Carvey deal with all this? A little Saturday Night Live guy. He was in all of those guys, and which was perfect because his character was that, you know, he's their probation officer, but he's in all of those guys. Right. So Dana, Dana was, and Dana was a good actor. I mean, he's funny as hell, but back then he came in just to read, that character wasn't written funny. It was just, just this, you know, the, the guy who's trying to keep these guys from getting back in trouble. Uh, but I mean, I, I was really happy with casting Jim Carrey read for that part and a bunch of other people, but Dana was great because he was very kind of youthful, innocent, sincere guy. Yeah. And, and so I put him on tape and I cast him and everybody was happy. And then the studio calls and says, we're worried about this Dana Carvey guy. Why? Well, we don't think he's funny. I go, well, he's not, not trying to be funny. He's, he's a sincere young guy who is in all of these guys. Well, can he be funnier? I go, look, he's he's a comedian. I'm sure he can be funnier. So I had to I had to retest him funny. How so do you he, tell an actor to be funny? Like could I you told just him, I told him exactly what we were doing. I said, these guys don't think you're funny. Uh I don't think you should play it any differently than you have, but let's try and take it to a, a, a sillier place. So he did it and they loved it. And so I said, so now you I can cast this guy. And they said, they said, well, he's too funny. He's going over the top. I said, well, okay. So if he can be not funny and too funny, then he can probably go anywhere in between. So they let me, they let me cast him. And then and after that, that, Saturday Night Live. So that was, wait, he was, was already on Saturday Night Live. No, he wasn't. He wasn't? No, this was pre-Saturday Night Live. But he was doing stand-up. Right, I know. I worked with him. I have one of my own stories. One time I was... It was booked at a place called Igby's on the West Side, and it was Rosie O'Donnell, Dana Carvey, and myself. And I was just on the bill, but it was the three of us. But unbeknownst to me, until I got there, was Brandon Tartikoff was in the room, and Rosie O'Donnell. They were looking at her for some series, and uh, Lauren Michaels and that crew were looking at Dana because he was very facile with impressions and stuff like that for Saturday Night Live. And I went on and had one of the best shows I've ever had. Just fucking killed it. I was so excited. And then Dana and the, uh, Rosie, and he went directly, like, straight to New York to Saturday Night Live. She went straight to her series, and I went straight home. <laughs> well, two out of three ain't bad. <laughs> yeah. Years later, Dana Carvey, I mean, not, um, Brandon Tartikoff came up to me. Or he, I saw him at a restaurant. He was, oh, I saw you. You were really funny at the thing. And I go, okay, great. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. <laughs> yeah that's the story of my life you know like the, all those near misses but you know whatever well, i was thinking about kirk douglas coming out of i mean uh burt lancaster coming out of prison of course he'd done more time in in prison we'll than probably prison. any actor alive because he was <laughs> just a bird man of alcatraz you know? bird man and brute force and probably something else too yeah he was he, he spent a lot of time in prison yeah he spent a lot of time in hollywood prisons and then at some point Let's talk about 
this iconic movie that you did that was almost one of the defining comedies of its decade, and that was Revenge of the Nerds. Um, okay, so Joe was in the person that I mentioned before. He right. was an he was an agent, then he was a producer, and I worked on some of his stuff. And then uh, I had done Natural Enemies, and I showed it to him, and he he said, "Boy, he said I I, I think you did a good job, but I don't know why you did this. You know, who's ever going to see this movie?" Which was honest. And then uh, when I had optioned Eddie Macon's run, Joe and Joe was going to be the producer. This was pre Marty Bregman, and when Joe read the script. He said, you did a really good job adapting this book, but I, I don't think I'm going to be able to get it financed. Okay. That's, that's when I ended up with Bregman. So then I did Eddie Macon's run. I got fired off it, whatever. Uh, and then that summer I get a call from Joe one day and he goes, you won't believe what just happened. I said, what? He goes, I'm head of production of 20th Century Fox. And he said, I'm probably going to be fired in a year but at least I'll be able to give my friends some jobs. So he sent, sent me a few scripts. One was Bachelor Party. One was a thing called Give Me an F about cheerleader camp and this Revenge of the Nerds thing. And nerds was not a thing yet in the world. Was it a part of our vocabulary yet? He's not a nerd. Really, not, not really. It came that, that came after that. But there had been one magazine article about computer geeks and it was called Revenge of the Nerds. This was not not what the movie was based on, but the guys that wrote the movie basically lifted that title and used it. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there's going to be this comedy, Revenge of the Nerds. And I said, I, I didn't even, first when he sent me the script, I wasn't even going to read it because it sounded so stupid. I don't know what a nerd is, but it's just stupid. But when I read it, the first couple of pages was exactly like my first day at college. You know, you get there and you feel like, you don't know anybody and you feel unacceptable and you go hide in your room. That's what I did. So I thought I, I could relate to this. So Joe said, well, here's a, there's a problem. What? Uh, the producers have seen your other movies and they don't even want to talk to you, but I'm going to force them to have a meeting with you. So you got to fly out here and meet with the producer. So I had to go out and audition for these producers who, who had decided that I had no sense of humor. <laughs> from and they were right based on my first two movies right so i fly out and i i guess i must have prepared well for that audition or something but it lasted a long time and it felt pretty good so then i fly back and i, and I was teaching a class at columbia a film class at the time uh which was great because that's what the, the school that i had gotten kicked out of in 1954 oh. so that was great for me uh <laughs> So I'm teaching this class. So I, so the, the next day I call Joe and I go, he, oh, he calls me and he goes, so what happened at the, uh, at the meeting? I said, well, I think it went really well. We seemed to see the movie the same way. It lasted like two hours. You know, I felt pretty good. He said, yeah, you made one mistake. I said, what? He said, you said Risky Business was a better movie than Animal House. I said, well, it is. Well, what kind of a movie are you going to make for this? I said, well, the best movie I can, given the script. It, yeah, this script is more like Animal House, but I want I don't want it to be a cartoon. I want the characters to be real, I, you know, because that's how that's why people will relate to it. We don't want to spend the whole time laughing that they wear glasses or something. Right. So what kind of a movie are you going to make? I go, Joe, you want me to go Animal House, sir? He goes, that would be good. And now I realize I'm on speakerphone and there's probably the producers are in the room or something. So I go, Joe, let me tell you this. I flew out to do this audition and I told my class that I'm teaching that I'm flying out to LA to audition, to direct a stupid teenage comedy. He says, now we're talking. <laughs> he, says, he goes, I want you to make a movie that not only will it never play at cinema two in New York, but you'll never be allowed in there again. I said, I'll tell you what, Joe, I promise I'll make a movie. I'm ashamed to put my name on. He goes, you got the job. <laughs> <laughs> We had some great actors in that movie. I mean, you had none of them wanted to be in it. That was everybody reacted the same way. This seems like it could be a stupid comedy about geeky looking people. And I don't want to do it. Bobby didn't want to do it. Anthony didn't want to do it. Tim Busfield wanted to do it because he needed to work. But right. he, he his character practically had no lines. And he was just a goofy looking half blind guy. Booger 
tells a story. He Booger wrote a book about his experience, and he tells a story about how he was coming in to read, uh, and he had read the script, and he said, "I'll play any one of the characters except Booger. I'm not playing that character." So he comes in, and Booger didn't have a whole lot of lines to read, so he read Anth Lewis Anthony's part, and he was pretty good, but he didn't seem like that but i thought he'd be a great booger because the way it's written booger was supposed to be a fat slob but that's that's too obvious this guy is small and but he's full of hostility which is kind of cool so i offered him booger and in his book he talks about i he told his agent I, under no circumstances can you say yes to that role and his agent called and said they want you for booger he said i'll take it <laughs> 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 and he's done four role, four movies as Booger. That's amazing. Yeah, well, Timothy, I think, was is a great actor. I mean, I had the best experience I've ever had in my one experience was with Timmy on my movie, The Solar Opposite. Was he in that? Yeah, he played opposite Chris Maloney. So oh, I don't even remember Tim being in that. Yeah, yeah Tim was a really good, really good guy. And uh, he works all the time as a director now, and I don't. So there you go. I know, he's Mr. Television. I, <laughs> That's right. He's, he's, I met him originally because i had little mini co-star parts on 30 something and we okay. both played baseball and i was on all these little hardball leagues and timothy you know that you know fancied himself a great baseball player he was pretty good but i mean but for his acting career you know we would have been in the major leagues for sure uh <laughs> Me too. yeah yeah um but i love timmy yeah i just we did a podcast together a couple of a year ago and must have gone two hours you know he's um but you know you get to a certain point and it's i don't know i don't watch movie i mean the movie business today first of all people are afraid to go to the theaters I don't even i'm just starting to go back in the last couple of months i just started going back to movie theaters and most of them if you go in the morning because you don't have a job uh it's empty it's so that empty. it doesn't doesn't feel like a, a petri dish but it's the same amount of people in the theater as when i'm at home watching on television hey there you go that's right. That's right. <laughs> it's like wait you had the same seat uh i saw a good movie it was, it was sam mendes's new movie uh bright wait yeah i saw that empire uh, of light it's beautifully made beautifully made and yeah. a nice movie i, I was kind of surprised it seemed like such a small story i was surprised that he wanted to tell that story but it was good yeah, it was good. I mean, and my expectations were low. So the the thing that kills me is just the, first of all, I live in Hollywood. My favorite place is now Moribund, the Cinerama Dome and Arclight. They get shut down? It's been gone. I mean, it's there. It's, it's closed. Oh, wow, I didn't know that. I did a jazz show in front of the Cinerama Dome and behind there with my clarinet on YouTube, just mourning the, the loss of movies you know um yeah i like that movie though i mean but we lost the theaters I, it's like I and some I, I saw tar and i saw it in in the mor morning at a theater on the big screen and i was so glad i did because everything about that movie is bigger than you think you what's know? the movie tar kate blanchett playing a conductor uh, oh, yeah. it's about this and she has a you know a lot of struggles in her life but she's a brilliant conductor and every time she gets up and and works you watch her work and the, the sound is because it was in the theater is like really powerful and it's a it's like a character but she's got a really fucked up personality in life and and i'm sure she's going to win the oscar for this movie but nobody will see it no no well i don't know if they'll see it but the i think I'm sure there's a big campaign by whoever represents her. And I'm sure she's like one of the favorites. I've seen people talking about it. Do you remember when movies that actually got nominated for Best Picture and Oscars were actually also hits? Yeah, Once Upon a Time. Like now, I don't know. I, I, don't, I don't even... I heard that one with Will Smith as The Slave is Good, Emancipation. Okay, I haven't seen that. I haven't seen that. The one I would kind of wanted to see because I saw the making of thing is the, I don't want to call it a remake. It's just revisiting the book of All Quiet on the Western Front. Oh, I haven't seen that. Yeah. Yeah. I heard somebody tell me that was good. Yeah. I mean, 
that the first one, you know, with I think Lewis Milestone. I, I mean, you know, that. Did you ever see the original? I mean, it's fantastic. Well, Lou Ayers. Uh, I probably did, but this was, probably was. A, it's a long, it's time, a long ago. time ago. But I'm, TV. Yeah, I've seen. I mean, who would see it in the theaters? But I saw it. That one, that movie just knocked me out. Um, what was the documentary you, like you did with Kurt about his life uh, while I still? What was it? While I still? Before I forget. Before I forget. That was the play. I mean, it was. Oh, a that stage, was the play. Stage performance, and it was. He, you know, he's written a bunch of books, and he had written some. His, his autobiography, Ragman's Son, was a bestseller, and right. and he got bored sitting home not doing work and he was always trying to generate something and one day he said to me i want to do this one man show i said really he goes yeah i've been writing it i said oh that's great and he either let me read some of it or he did some of it for me and i thought this could be great i mean we could you know if, you, if we can you know you put in some film clips or whatever and expand it yeah bert lancaster could play the part <laughs> yeah right you know, get bert bigger name foreign uh, <laughs> get Bert to play you <laughs> anyway he he that all came out of him in fact one of his children not Michael called me and, and said uh, don't let him do it he's going to make a fool of himself because he had 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 his stroke and that was part the opening of this the play is him talking to the audience and he comes out on stage and he goes when you have a stroke you must speak very slowly and i find and he was exaggerating it when you speak slowly people listen <laughs> and then he goes on gets gets more relaxed and he just won everybody over and, and it was just great three nights great experience well he i think you know he achieved a certain kind of nobility when he was diminished you know in his life after a stroke that he didn't for all his celebrity and fame and, you know, he was on a winning streak since he was a man with a horn. I mean, I don't know what was his first movie for Christ's sakes, but he, he's just been on a winning streak on so many levels. Um, and then he, since, since the stroke, he, he did a few things. He did a little a bit part in a Stallone movie. And then the, then a whole movie that where he was the star called diamonds, mm -hmm. uh, which I thought I was going to end up directing, but, didn't work out uh, but it was an independent film and it was called something else It was called sundown and it was about alzheimer's and i said to kirk well you could do that but why don't you make it about a stroke you know you you know that and that way the your speech you know is perfect and and it can be your story so we rewrote it about that and the producer said okay and they went forward and then some somebody called maybe it was kirk and said by the way they have it they have a director so I, I wasn't the director of that, uh, but he did that, and uh, he he did a thing called Greedy, uh, Michael J. Fox movie, where he played basically himself, a guy in a wheelchair, which he wasn't, but and basically he's he's testing, he's a, a multi millionaire, and he's testing all his potential beneficiaries to see who really loves him. Kind of a King Lear sort of a thing. Exactly. And and so it's all about how all Phil Hartman was one and they were how greedy they all were, except Michael J. Fox. So of course, that's who ends up getting this. I knew Eric Douglas. Uh, he was hanging around a lot of the comedy clubs when I was doing it. And he befriended yeah. me. And he was kind of a sad story. He looked so much like his father to me. Yeah. Like, and I mean, that, that and they did. Kirk got him some acting jobs where they worked together and, and he wasn't bad and he did stand up. I don't know that he was that funny. I never saw him do the stand up. He was but troubled. Was, yeah. Troubled yeah. guy. He was. He was. Wow. Jeez. Looking back on all this now, what's what do you, you are you editing now? I mean, is that your main or No, I I I do podcasts. Oh, I mean, this is this is I'm where here. the money is. I was <laughs> I I didn't realize that this whole exercise in uh, screenwriting and acting and uh, the movie making was just a way to break into podcasting who knew yeah no podcasting m m one of my my firstborn son produces podcasts oh okay here in, here in new york and i didn't even know that that was something you people do but he like there's a real estate company that that does podcasts to, i guess there's an audience for that i don't know uh and and my 
other son did a podcast which was a little more about his life but then he went into politics so he doesn't I do that anymore i saw where he ran for office in ran tennessee for he ran for Congress. he moved to tennessee because he wasn't really earning enough to, to justify the expense of living in la and he, he was married and and his wife had got a job she's a really accomplished person and she became the the authority on dealing with autistic children in the tennessee the nashville tennessee school area okay so he goes visits school after school helping the teachers deal with these kids and so they're, they're down there and he got involved in local politics and realized that there's a woman named marcia blackburn who was then in, uh, in the house of representatives and he went to a couple of meetings where he said she was really obnoxious and he got angry and he went down to the democratic party and said why don't you run somebody against her and they said we don't have anybody she was Democrat, though, in Nashville, right? No, she was a Republican. She was Republican. Okay. Yeah. And the Democrats were, they, they were, they had already given up. They, there's no way they're going to win anybody down there. So he said, well, there must be somebody. And they go, why don't you run? And he goes, me? And they go, yeah, we won't give you any money, but we'll give you a, product, a campaign manager and this and that. And if you can raise the money, you can go as our candidate. So that's what he did. And he raised money and he did it. A reasonably good campaign and the election night i was down there and he when he it was announced that oh and, and then marsha blackburn bowed out and another guy named mark green came in and he became the republican uh, candidate and somehow he won what election cycle was that 2018 i think 18 so that was a big when they flipped for the Democrats during the middle of Trump's uh, reign of terror, maybe it was 2016. I now I now I'm not sure, but but uh, yeah, it might have been further back. But anyway, Justin said to me at the end of the night, he said, "Well, I've been busting my ass for a year and a half, and I got exactly the same number of votes I would have gotten if I had never left my house." <laughs> 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 well, I mean, because the de- now he got all the Democrats, but there wasn't enough. Not enough. But now, then now he's involved, kind of an outgrowth of his podcast. He has, I don't even know what you'd call it. It's called the Tennessee Holler, H O L L E R. And it's a, he has guests and they talk and there's, it goes on Facebook Live and this and that. And it's, it's expanded from one that he did himself. There's a Memphis holler, a Chattanooga holler, a West Virginia holler, it, 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 and you know it's branches of the same tree. And he started it, and then he still oh. goes on and does his thing. So you like he goes down. He does. He likes it there. I mean, you know, there's there's an element there that's hard to be comfortable with, but he, you know, he lives a much nicer life at his level of salary than he could ever in L.A. So he's happy there, and he has two kids and. Nice. And, and he, but he's really caught up in that political world now where he's one of the voices in Tennessee politics. I wrote a script. My last screenplay takes place the first half all in Nashville in 1959. Well, 1960. It's about the, the kids that were at the lunch counters. It all starts in Nashville well, from the little black colleges, uh, Fisk and the others. And there's a lot of interesting cross currents in his history in Nashville with Vanderbilt and, um, Kind of they considered themselves the Athens of the South. The Gore family was very prominent in uh, Tennessee, but yeah, I mean, I, I'm going to be there next week. I go, I go there a lot, and uh, it's it is nice, you know. Uh, if you, once you once you ignore the political reality of you know, and, but he's fighting against that, and he he just helped a guy named Justin Jones get elected to Congress from down there, and and. Uh, yeah, I mean, he, he he really he's serious about it, and whatever we're doing right now is 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 it is it just a podcast? Or when it's visual, is it still a podcast? Well, I'm not sure the exact definition. So, like, what happens is this: I will when I say goodbye to you uh, shortly, I'll press N. It'll download this video to me, and then basically, there's been no interruption. So it'll just once I have the file. I'll just upload it. I'll capture some a p- couple pictures where I look really good and you don't. And then I'll use that as the uh, thing. And then yeah, it'll, it's better. yeah, there you go. And then uh-huh. it'll give me another file, which will just be this audio. 
then I'll dump that into logic and, um, you know, I'll compress it as just to make it a little tighter because I'm stumbling and repeating myself. And then that'll go up and I put it on my little social media and hope people find it. You know, sometimes I'm surprised, um, you know, and, and sometimes I'm not, you know, and it's, it's fun. You know, it's, it's like, it helped me during COVID cause it's like, Hey, I did a show. I'm, I have a series. <laughs> Yeah, why not? Look, that's what people are more likely to watch something. Do they watch this on their phone too sometimes? I think people mostly catch stuff on their phones. Uh, some people yeah. watch on computers, but they'll see this on their phone. I did some really interesting shows. I did one with Kermit Roosevelt, Teddy's great, great grandson, who's a law professor who writes about the Constitution. I did one with this guy who writes about dinosaurs. He, he's the Jurassic he's advisor on Jurassic park. He got me. And then I did a dinosaur dig in South Dakota. So I just kind of live in this sort of Anthony Bourdain kind of playing the lead role in my own life sort of experience through this and the technology, you know, it used to be, I spent my whole life trying to get some jerk off at an agency to talk to me on the off chance that he might like something that I did to actually call somebody else. And now admittedly, there's no big financial reward here that I've discovered. But at least I'm not a beggar for an opportunity. I'm just doing my thing. And I'm a little bit happier for that. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I do. Know. I mean, yeah. you know, I'm, I'm at a point where, well, I shouldn't, I shouldn't, should I talk about this? I don't want to say I've surrendered or given up, but I don't delude myself as much as I used to that I can get something going. Uh, but Me I still too. have a couple of things that I that I would want to do, but I, um, I got to the point. And this is this dates back quite a few years, where all of a sudden I'd be sending somebody that I used to work with, you know, a, a producer or a, an agent, something to read, and I would get one of these, you know, well, we really can't read this, you know, uh, unless it came to us through so such and such or oh, whatever, and, and that's frustrating to me. So I, I, even though I should still do it, because the one thing we should learn is don't don't let your hurt feelings stand in your way you know you got to get past that if you want to get what you want to get you know and i you know did you ever, so, go ahead did you, did you see the offer no is that a movie no it's it's a 10 part series on paramount plus you know, on the on tv or where, wherever those things are mm -hmm. it's so good it's so good uh and it's basically the chronicling the history of the making of the godfather oh like yeah i heard about that really good it's really good and and uh, the one thing bob the guy who plays bob evans is great and the one thing he keeps telling the albert ruddy guy who's played by miles teller uh is you just you do whatever you have to do to get your get what you want and get your movie made whether you have to eat shit whether you have to you know bend over whatever you got to do you got to be willing to do that and so that becomes the lesson of the piece that no matter what happens no matter that the mafia is threatening you not to make the movie you got to find a way you got to and it, it's i love this i really like watching it i like that because the message is you can't quit you just keep trying and what you just said is a lesson to me it almost it's like, Bill, because I got all this stupid pride that hurts me. Like, I can't go to that comedy club and do three minutes for this idiot when I can do four, an hour and a half and kick ass. It's just too painful for me. And it's just the humiliation in my own soul. And it's like, Bill, you got to find a way to take that and just get it. Just put it away. Don't. I, I'm not good at that. It's hard. No, I understand that. And it is hard. But, you know, you'll find, I think, that whatever, like, I've, I've made a couple of little tiny films. Recently, I did one where my daughter wrote it and starred in it. And, you know, you think, nobody's ever going to see this. But I enjoy it. I enjoyed the, the two days of that shoot as much as I ever, ever enjoyed any two days or of anything. I, it was the same process. You know, you have the performances, you have the script, you have the lighting, you, you have to get it all done, all that stuff. It was great. I, I would do it again tomorrow for nothing. Yeah, I, I did a guest star part on a TV series last week called American Auto. Never seen it. I think they're in their second season. But just have one day acting, you know, on a set with a, on, a, on Universal with a soundstage and lights. And, oh, there's even a chair for me, you know, when I'm not filming. Yeah. It's like, wow. 
I forgot. Oh, yeah, this is really fun. I forgot. This is really great. I forgot. Yeah. <laughs> the only thing now is there's this triple jeopardy every time you go on a set is you got to get COVID tested. So if you test positive, it's like, boom, you're out the door. Next guy in, you know, and there's yeah. like a test every fucking day. And it's scary because, you, I mean, I don't they're not going to rearrange the schedule for Bill. They're just going to go next, you know. Yeah. But that's the world we're in. But hey, Jeff, this has really been fun, man. Um, Look, well, that's good. I mean, I don't want to be boring. You're not boring. It's fun. I mean, it's you've had a, you know, how do you, you I mean, people say to me, I go, yeah, I, I wrote 10 scripts. I made one. I feel like a loser. And they go, yeah, but you made a movie, man. You know how many people have never made a movie? You should be happy. And I go, well, I guess yeah, so. And you you created you created Christopher Maloney. I mean, he'd be nothing with that. Yeah, you sent me that funny picture, and I sent it to Chris. Did said, you really? Yeah, I sent it to Chris, and I go, "Stop playing me." <laughs> <laughs> I sent the picture. I said, "Stop playing me," and I never heard back. It said delivered and read. You know, like he got it. <laughs> yeah, so, he probably will. He probably will be not like that. He, I don't know. I, he used to have a sense of humor. I guess I don't know. You know, he, years ago he would have laughed when we did like little Q and As, and sometimes people would say, "Cause I'm a comedian." We look similar. They go, "Bill, how come you didn't play the part?" And I always would say, "I go, I would have played the part, but the audience could never have believed that the girl could have left the character if I had played the part." Yeah, it right. Just, it wouldn't <laughs> have made sense. The logic would have broken down. So it's just made more sense to have. Chris, you know, yeah. but he's, he's like, uh, you know, a huge television star, you know, digging up mutilated, uh, sexually abused corpses every week. So it's been no, I, I have actually become addicted over the last couple of years to watching, to binge watching law, law and order special victims. It's, it's so twisted, but it's, they're, they're all pretty good. And I like watching it. I don't know why it's something relaxing about it. <laughs> I don't know. I, I, I never watch it. Cause I just, spent you know like when you edit or you know sit behind an editor on a feature you're like the, the guy's soul just goes into years over over the period so I, I had enough of Chris as much as I, I actually like him he's a cool guy but yeah yeah well Jeff stay healthy and when you come to Los Angeles let's hang out let's have lunch or do something all right um, when I'm when I'm out there after after Nashville maybe I'll be out there all right, bro. Well, thanks so much Bye, man. for joining me and to the huge audience out there on their cell phones. Thanks for hanging with me on a Rebel Without Applause. Till next time, namaste, shalom, and aloha. By that, I mean namashaloha. See you. <laughs> Take care. Bye. Bye.